Why do some people think that they can safely cheat on their partners and nothing will happen to them for it? And the most terrible thing is that many people do not feel guilty about it. My wife led a double life, and it seemed absolutely normal to her. She didn't even think that sooner or later she would be caught, and she would have to pay for it. We first crossed paths during our final year at university, amidst a night out with friends. It was Sarah's 21st birthday celebration, and fate brought us together at a local club in Nashville. Quite literally, our introduction involved me accidentally colliding with Sarah's table, causing her drink to spill into her lap. Following a few moments of initial awkwardness, I offered my apologies and aided her in cleaning up the mess I had inadvertently created. While some might label it as love at first sight, I believe there was a distinct chemistry between us, drawing us together like magnets. From that serendipitous encounter onward, we became inseparable, embarking on a journey of dating that eventually led to marriage. A year later, we exchanged vows and commenced our life as a couple. My name is Jonathan Parks, although my friends affectionately know me as Johnny. Armed with a degree in accounting, I pursued a career as a certified public accountant at a prominent firm in Atlanta, where Sarah and I chose to settle close to our families. Following invaluable experience gained in the corporate world, I ventured into entrepreneurship by establishing my own accounting firm. During the initial stages, Sarah, with her degree in business administration, provided unwavering support until the joyous news of our daughter Angel's impending arrival. Sarah and I shared a romantic bond akin to a fairy tale, deeply in love and inseparable. With the arrival of Angel, our beloved daughter, our love expanded to embrace our growing family. Over the next decade, we led a conventional family life, with me dedicating myself to business, while Sarah tended to our home and raised our daughter. Our bed life was intense. Passionate meetings took place at least three times a week. Our love was based on mutual respect and affection and was characterized by deep sensuality. I never pressed her, content with the richness of our life together and the joy of our relationship. I admired Sarah's constant attentiveness, which was evident from the moment we exchanged vows. Whether it was a kiss, a hug, holding hands, or linking arms, she always found ways to connect with me whenever we were together. The depth of intimacy in our marriage was remarkable, and I cherished every moment of our closeness. Despite the skepticism of our friends who often teased us, our bond endured, and after a decade of such affection, they came to recognize the uniqueness of our relationship. When Angel turned 10, Sarah expressed her desire to return to work. With Angel settled into a daily routine and returning home from school promptly at 3.30 p.m., Sarah articulated her longing to rejoin the workforce rather than remaining at home every day. After extensive discussions, we reached an agreement and devised a plan to ensure that Angel continued to receive the attention and care appropriate for a 10-year-old girl. Sarah secured a position as William Aston's personal assistant, a lawyer a decade her senior. The work hours were favorable, and Sarah relished the adult responsibilities, which boosted her self-esteem and confidence. She transitioned from being a homemaker to a professional and mother. Witnessing her joy in her career, I fully supported her. She managed to be home by four hours every afternoon, always present for Angel. Over time, our family bond grew stronger. We enjoyed a comfortable lifestyle, residing in an upscale apartment complex with access to a country club. With financial stability, we were able to set aside funds for Angel's education and our retirement. Our lives were rich in health, wealth, and happiness, free from worry. As you might expect, the dynamics of intimacy shift after a decade of marriage and like many couples, ours experienced a slowing down. Our frequency of lovemaking decreased from three to four times a week to just twice, typically on Friday and Saturday nights. Despite becoming somewhat predictable, our love remained strong and we cherished our bond. Sarah consistently showed her affection and devotion over the years, which I valued deeply. For me, the gestures of love and affection, such as random kisses and hugs, meant more than physical intimacy. Knowing that Sarah loved me deeply was the cornerstone of our relationship. Meanwhile, Angel joined the math club and stayed late after school until around 5 p.m. Concurrently, Sarah began working late two nights a week, 
aligning perfectly with my schedule and ensuring that Angel was never left alone in the evenings. Matching our schedules became a priority as we navigated parenthood and our evolving family dynamic. William, Sarah's boss, was promoted to the position of senior partner in his father-in-law's company. This promotion required Sarah to increase her working hours by a couple of evenings a week. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, she returned home at 7 p.m., and I made sure that dinner was ready for her after a long day at work. With the exception of these changes, everything else in our marriage remained the same. Meanwhile, my own business was thriving, bringing in a satisfactory income. The company expanded to 45 employees, and I found myself completely absorbed in its growth. We have developed into a reputable accounting firm, attracting attention due to potential acquisitions or mergers with larger companies in the region. Angel, who is now 15 years old, began to think about college and her future path. Sarah continued to work for William, maintaining her attractiveness from the day we first met. Time has been kind to Sarah, preserving her slender physique, highlighted by long, slender legs and other noticeable places. Having a pleasant face, she always radiated professionalism and conservatism. Our lifestyle may have been perceived by others as mundane. We mostly spent time together at home, sometimes going to the cinema or family gatherings with our daughter. As a family unit, we were inseparable, rarely going on solo walks or activities without each other's company. William, Sarah's boss, called me to inform that Sarah was going to be honored with an award at a banquet the following month. He also mentioned that both Angel and I were invited to attend. I accepted the invitation proudly and shared with Angel that her mother would be receiving recognition for her excellence in her profession. The award was a surprise, and they specifically wanted us there, although typically such events were restricted to staff, and we were requested to keep it confidential until the ceremony. Over the past five years of working under William, Sarah had consistently delivered outstanding performance, which seemed to bring her joy at home and bolster her self-esteem. Knowing how hard she had worked and how well-regarded she was within the company, hearing about their desire to express appreciation made both Angel and me swell with pride. Sarah mentioned an upcoming business meeting at the downtown Ritz-Carlton, where she would be working late to deliver a presentation to the entire company. She seemed excited about the presentation and had dedicated numerous hours to preparing for it in the weeks leading up to the event. At that point, she was unaware of our invitation or her impending award, and Angel and I kept our secret. We were eagerly anticipating the ceremony and Sarah's acknowledgement. I took Angel shopping for a new dress, and I purchased a new suit to ensure that our family would stand out proudly at the awards ceremony. Sarah donned a knee-length dress featuring a tasteful back cutout, projecting professionalism while accentuating her captivating curves. At 37, she remained alluring and desirable. Prior to her departure for the meeting, Angel and I embraced her, extending our best wishes for her evening presentation. With two hours to spare post Sarah's departure, we promptly prepared ourselves and arrived at the event venue approximately 30 minutes before her scheduled talk. A host warmly welcomed us, escorting us to a centrally located table offering an unobstructed view of the stage. We received special attention, with attendees expressing their admiration for Sarah and their pleasure in meeting us. The atmosphere was welcoming and we were elated to support our wife and mother. As the audience lights dimmed, the stage introductions commenced. Spotlights danced across the platform as the initial speaker introduced the firm's founder, followed by the CEO and William, the senior partner. William delivered a succinct address highlighting the company's achievements over the past year before introducing Sarah to share some of those successes. Sarah graced the stage with her timeless beauty, and I noticed the pride in Angel's eyes as she witnessed her mother commence her presentation. With a poised and polished demeanor, Sarah delved into a discussion about the company's stellar year, highlighting their triumphs and forthcoming projects. Her speech lasted around 10 minutes, and upon its conclusion, she yielded the platform to William. However, before departing, William embraced her tenderly, keeping her close as he addressed the audience. Ladies and gentlemen, before Sarah exits the stage, I'd like to express a few words. Over the past five years, Sarah and I have collaborated closely 
and she has become an indispensable asset to our organization and my professional life. I firmly believe that without her, we wouldn't have attained some of the accomplishments she outlined today. It's my distinct honor tonight to present Sarah with our most esteemed accolade, the Chairman's Club Award. This recognition is reserved for employees who consistently go above and beyond their duties and are acknowledged for their unwavering dedication to the company. She was presented with a sizable plaque along with an envelope containing a $10,000 award. Tears welled in her eyes as she graciously accepted the check, embraced William, then turned to acknowledge the audience, expressing her gratitude. Angel and I were also moved to tears, overwhelmed with pride for her mother. The individuals at our table enveloped me in hugs, creating one of our most joyous evenings. Overflowing with pride, we couldn't help but wear constant smiles. As the lights brightened, signaling a break, I took hold of my daughter's glass and assured her of my quick return as I made my way towards one of the bars situated on the room's periphery. Witnessing the lengthy lines, I spotted a vacant spot near the stage and headed there to fetch a double jack and a soft drink for Angel. Brimming with contentment and a sense of generosity, I grinned and dropped five dollars into the tip jar before collecting our drinks and turning back towards our table. Yet, in that very moment, my world shattered. As I made my way back, something caught my attention, prompting me to turn and investigate. Hidden behind the curtains, shielded from the prying eyes of others, a couple was locked in a tender embrace, exchanging kisses. I found this sight odd and unexpected for the occasion, but initially brushed it off. It wasn't until I recognized the dress that my wife Sarah had worn on a particular night that my curiosity intensified. Turning back for another glance, I found myself rooted to the spot. The couple, still deeply engrossed in their affectionate display, seemed oblivious to everything else. The familiarity and ease of their embrace hinted that this wasn't their first love encounter. Behind the veil of the curtain, they seemed to feel secure in their intimacy, oblivious to the world around them. I felt a surreal detachment as I observed the scene, holding two drinks in my trembling hands, my mouth agape. I remained motionless as I watched them until they eventually parted ways, confirming my worst fears. It was indeed my beloved Sarah, sharing a passionate kiss with her boss, William. In that moment, I dropped one of the drinks, the clatter drawing the attention of the unsuspecting Coupla. As the man's gaze met hers, a look of astonishment crossed her face, and in that instant, I felt a jolt back to reality, my senses returning. I was left speechless, feeling a sinking sensation in my stomach and a sudden ache in my heart. Unsure of what to do, I turned, clutching my drink, and made my way back to our table. In tow, Sarah hurried after me, catching up just as I reached our spot. Darling, I just discovered you and Angel were attending the award ceremony. Thank you for being here, sweetheart. What you witnessed wasn't what it seemed, dear. Let's talk later, all right? I simply nodded, retreating to our table where Sarah reappeared to a chorus of congratulations. Angel showered her with affection, blissful in her mother's triumph. Meanwhile, I remained in a daze, wearing what I presumed to be a somber expression, silent throughout. Sarah mentioned she had a few more tasks to tend to before rejoining us. Angel noticed my shift in demeanor and attempted to inquire about my troubles. Yet, I could only shake my head, offering no further explanation for the remainder of the evening. It was evident I was in distress, no longer able to feign happiness amidst the festivities. I am certain about what I witnessed, and it surpassed mere friendly affection. It dawned on me that Sarah and I hadn't shared such a passionate kiss in years. Looking back, it had been over five years since we embraced so fervently. Reflecting on those years and the changes that had occurred, my mind raced with the realization that trouble was looming, though I couldn't pinpoint its exact nature at that moment. On the drive home, Angel and Sarah engaged in conversation about the previous night, with Sarah expressing pride in her mother. Despite feeling shaken by what I had witnessed, I remained silent throughout the journey, lost in my thoughts. Both girls noticed my lack of speech and attempted to coax me into talking, but I stubbornly maintained my silence. 
Sensing my unease, Sarah tried to reconcile by being kind and particularly affectionate. But I wasn't ready to discuss it that evening. I attempted to conceal my emotions from Angel, but she was perceptive enough to detect the change in me. Before Angel retired for the night, she quietly reassured me, Dad, if you ever need to talk, I'm here for you, okay? She embraced and kissed me before heading to bed. I went straight to bed without uttering a word, and shortly afterward I heard Sarah enter the room. Johnny, are you all right, darling? After a full minute of silence, she inquired, Sweetheart, would you like to talk to me? Her tone conveyed her unease. As she settled into bed and attempted to embrace me, I turned away. Listen, I understand how it appeared, and I'm deeply sorry. I'm at a loss for words, but it wasn't what it seemed. Please, let's talk. Without a word, I lay there, my silence giving way to anger as shock subsided. I chose not to speak further, recognizing that anything I said in that moment would only cause more harm and wouldn't resolve anything that night. She reached out to comfort me, but I disregarded her attempts, enduring the most restless sleep of my life. The following morning, a Saturday, I knew it would be a challenging day when I awoke to sunlight streaming through the window. I lay there, replaying the scene I had witnessed, trying to comprehend it. Eventually, I got out of bed, went to the bathroom, and attended to my morning routine. Upon returning to the bedroom, Sarah was sitting up watching me, attempting to maintain normalcy. Good morning, darling. Did you sleep well? She asked, as if nothing had transpired. I brushed off her question, threw on a pair of jeans and a t-shirt, and without saying a word since the kiss, I glanced at her before leaving the bedroom. With a resentful glare, I finally broke the silence since the banquet. How long? She remained silent, focusing on her hands. I walked away, leaving her behind, and went to grab breakfast, needing some time alone to process. I ended the interaction feeling distressed. I sense a shift coming in our relationship, and I dread hearing what she has to say about her affair. She knows she must confess because she understands. I'll see through any lies. Sarah and I have always been close, and I've never had reason to doubt her fidelity. There have been no signs of her distancing herself from me. She still shows affection regularly. How can she betray me like this while continuing to act lovingly? Can the woman I love truly be having an affair with William? Oh my goodness, this is dreadful, and I can hardly believe it happened. William understands that he shouldn't display affection publicly, yet tonight he couldn't resist kissing me. While I do appreciate his affection and the excitement of the moment, He's well aware of my stance on public displays of affection and the risks involved. Now I'm faced with a major dilemma. How do I explain to Johnny what he witnessed? He's not naive, and I anticipate it won't be easy. I recall when William and I first embarked on this affair. It began a year after I became his personal assistant, during a period when he was experiencing marital issues. With six young children, including twins, keeping his wife preoccupied, they were going through a rough patch. He confided in me, and our bond grew stronger as I supported him through this tough time, albeit not without repercussions. William, a resilient and compassionate man, garnered my admiration, and I found myself wanting to alleviate his distress. There were occasions when I comforted him with hugs, reassuring him that things would improve and urging him to cherish his wife. During one of these hugs, a spark broke out between us, which caused us to use the leather sofa in his office. Reflecting on it now, I realize my actions were self-serving, entangled in his influence. The respect I garnered as his assistant inflated my ego, making me feel superior to my colleagues. William's lavish praise and workplace compliments further fueled this illusion. With William poised to ascend to CEO in the coming years, my proximity to him fostered a distorted sense of self-worth. I found myself compelled to comfort him when I noticed his distress resurface that significant evening. William had just finished a heated argument with his wife over the phone, and seeing how distraught he was, I embraced him reassuringly, assuring him that everything would be all right. As we held each other, he expressed his gratitude and unexpectedly kissed me. Our eyes met, and that kiss unfolded into a two-hour encounter in his office. Enchanted by his influence, I withdrew emotionally during that time. My inclination to express affection through embraces and kisses led to that singular night. The following day, we discussed it and mutually acknowledged it 
as a one-time occurrence that we needed to move past. In the aftermath, I was consumed by remorse and guilt, contemplating confessing to Johnny, but knowing it would jeopardize our marriage. Returning home, I was certain Johnny was aware of my transgression, yet, as always, he and Angel embraced me warmly, showering me with the love they always did upon my late returns. My heart shattered, overwhelmed by guilt. In that moment, I resolved to keep silent, acknowledging that the events of that night were a fleeting occurrence unlikely to repeat. In the following months, we often worked late into the night, and within a few weeks, we found ourselves in each other's embrace once again. I had no intention of betraying Johnny, as my love for him was unwavering, and I couldn't bear to inflict any harm on our marriage. However, being with William was different. In his arms, I felt a sense of security that was unparalleled. Despite William not being conventionally attractive and posing no competition to my remarkable husband, I found solace in his presence. Johnny had become acquainted with William and was confident not only in my fidelity, but also in William's lack of threat, which eased his mind about our late-night collaborations. William was a tall man, towering over six feet, with large, powerful hands and an impressive physique. Initially, our connection lacked love or emotional depth, centered solely on physical intimacy. However, as the years passed, our bond deepened, evolving into a profound affection. Surprisingly, our affair played a role in helping William salvage his marriage. Our discreet rendezvous twice a week seemed to provide him with a sense of balance in his domestic life. Knowing I was contributing positively to William's situation without disadvantaging anyone else allowed me to rationalize our arrangement and deflect any guilt. Personally, my life was fulfilling, my professional standing secure, and I derived immense satisfaction from my job. As William ascended to a higher position, I began dedicating two nights a week to work. During these evenings, William and I indulged in our private moments within the confines of his secure office space. We both felt confident that our liaison would remain undetected in this secluded environment. After acknowledging the longevity of our relationship, we mutually agreed to confine our interactions to those designated evenings, ensuring discretion and preserving boundaries. For three years, we spent time together twice a week, enjoying both physical and emotional intimacy. Over time, our relationship went beyond just love, developing into something deeper than just a physical connection. William occupied a spacious corner office, and when the staff left in the evenings, I often brought folders to his office, closing the door behind me, which was not unusual. There was a big leather sofa in his office where we spent time together. My experience with William was different from my experience with Johnny. He introduced me to new sensations and desires that I had not experienced before. While my husband gave me tenderness and warmth, William acted a little differently. I found myself experiencing the best of both worlds, not wanting it to ever end. Somehow, I managed to separate this affair with my boss from my personal life, and it didn't affect my personal life. Johnny and Angel continued to receive my love and attention without any drawback. I found myself offering William the same level of closeness and attention that I gave Johnny. I came to understand that some men appreciate and are drawn to this depth of affection and attention, finding women even more appealing as a result. During those special occasions, I became William's confidant at work, and we both valued what we shared, despite knowing it could never extend beyond our encounters. Neither of us wished to harm our spouses, so our affair evolved into a close friendship. Any initial guilt I felt dissipated, replaced by a sense of entitlement. I believed I deserved the lifestyle I was leading. At work, we adhered to strictly professional behavior, and no one suspected our secret relationship. William often talked about his children and proudly displayed family photos in his office. Many considered him a devoted father and family man. In the same way, I was highly respected, and revealing our little secret would undoubtedly shock my colleagues. Every moment of each day, apart from those rare hours per week, I dutifully played the role of a devoted wife, maintaining the facade of normalcy for Johnny and Angel. I ensured Johnny's well-being, consistently expressing my affection and prioritizing his needs in a way that's difficult to articulate. My love for him and our family compelled me to shield them from any harm caused by my actions. Naively, I convinced myself that the time spent with William each week was inconsequential to our family life, akin to a casual dinner with a friend. However, 
the realization that my relationship with William could jeopardize my marriage has dawned upon me. Johnny's probing gaze this morning, accompanied by his question, How long? Signaled trouble. He's perceptive. He knows something isn't right. What am I supposed to tell him? Should I confess the truth? I can't bear to lose him or imagine life without him. I'm at a loss. Despite shedding tears into my pillow for the past hour, I remain bereft of any solutions. It's clear that I must come clean and implore his understanding. I believe in his love for me. I have to hope for his forgiveness. Glancing at the clock, I realized Angel should have been at the school for the math club by 1 p.m., signaling it was time to confront the situation. Upon arriving home, I discovered Sarah seated on the patio, gazing at the lake with a cup of coffee in hand. Without uttering a word, I poured myself a cup, settled beside her, and posed those two dreaded words. How long? After several minutes of silence, I observed tears streaming down Sarah's cheeks. What followed sent chills down my spine and a sickening feeling in my stomach. In a soft, tear-laden voice, she uttered, Three years. The nights you stayed late? Once more, she responded in a barely audible whisper, Yes. I sat in silence again, gathering my thoughts before I spoke. Let me make sure that I have understood correctly. Are you saying that the only times you cheated on me with William in the last three years were on those two nights when you worked late every week? She nodded, her voice trembling. Yes, that's right. This has never happened anywhere else. I have so much to explain if you'll just listen. Save it. You have just admitted that you have been romantically involved with your boss twice a week for the past three years. You don't need to be a mathematician to perform basic arithmetic operations. You've been intimate with him over 300 times, and I highly doubt it was just once a night. So let's assume that it happened at least twice. Damn it, Sarah. You've been with this guy over 500 times and all behind my back. Do you have any idea how unbearable this is for any man? Tears streamed down her cheeks as I continued to insist. You two must have had a great time mocking me behind my back, treating me like some ignorant cuckold. I can only imagine what you were saying about me or how he laughed at sleeping with my wife behind closed doors. Thank you very much, Sarah. I never thought that you would be capable of such betrayal. I have never felt so humiliated and intentionally hurt in my life. I believed that you loved me, that I was your only one. I loved you with everything I had. I would give my life for you. But Sarah, you ruined our marriage and broke my heart. Johnny, it's not like that. This is... I interjected, instructing her to be quiet. Rising from my seat on the porch, I left her behind, tears streaming down her face as she pleaded for me to stay. Outwardly composed, inwardly I was seething, seeking solace in a drive to regain control of my emotions. Experiencing a newfound sense of betrayal, I required time to sort through my feelings, her words, and determine my course of action. I needed someone to talk to, and the only family member I had left was my brother Tony. Despite being close during our upbringing, we followed divergent paths in life. While I maintained a clean record as a churchgoer and accountant, Tony spent five years in federal prison for involvement in drug trafficking and associated with dangerous circles. Although our communication was sparse, Tony had always relied on me for support. I stood by him during his trial and, leveraging my political connections, managed to reduce his sentence from the mandatory 20 years to five. That morning, I reached out to him. Hey, Tony, it's me, your older brother. Bro, how have you been? What's going on? I'm facing a problem and I need to talk to someone. Can you spare some time? Of course, what's troubling you? This is tough. Sarah cheated on me and I just found out. I'm lost and hurting, driving around with a heavy heart. I thought about drowning my sorrows in alcohol, but that's not the answer. I had to confide in someone. I'm sorry for burdening you with this. Wow, I care about Sarah, and it's shocking to hear she did this to you. Have you identified the person involved and the specifics? I know who it is, but I'm still in the dark about all the details. I'm seething with anger and I want payback. I'm so furious I feel like strangling my wife. Listen, I've known people who've been through similar situations, 
and I understand your emotions. You need to let go of your rage. Hit the gym, go for a run, do whatever helps you cool down. I'm here to support you through this. Face the reality, gather information, and then decide your next steps. I'll assist you with any plans you devise. Try not to reveal too much and strive to maintain a sense of normalcy, although it'll undoubtedly be challenging. Call me tomorrow with any updates and I'll lend you a hand. Thanks, Tony. Your support means a lot. I'll reach out tomorrow, I concluded, ending the call. While driving, I noticed a mattress store and a spark of inspiration struck me. I pulled into the parking lot and took the initiative. My original plan was to stay in the marriage until Angel finished college, which meant I'd be committed for another two years. I had no intention of being intimate with Sarah again, and I refused to abandon my own bedroom. So I devised my initial action plan, realizing there was much more to be done. After consulting with the salesperson, I agreed to pay full price for the two full-size beds I had selected, along with all the accompanying furniture, including the headboard, and requested assembly and all necessary hardware. Additionally, I paid an extra $100 for the dismantling of the current king-size bed. Payment was made, and we scheduled delivery for 4 p.m. that same afternoon. I messaged Angel to inform her that I would pick her up, drove to her school, and waited in the parking lot. We then went to lunch where I gently broached the subject of upcoming changes at home. What happened at dinner last night, Daddy? I know something happened. I'm not naive. Please don't keep me in the dark. It's not fair. You've always been honest with me, so please don't change. All right, it's fair. And since it's going to be tough, you deserve to know. I caught your mother kissing her boss backstage. Dad, he was probably just congratulating her. You can't be that upset about a kiss. After I confronted her, she admitted to having an affair with him for three years. It's something I can't comprehend, and that's why our relationship has changed forever. Are you going to divorce her, Dad? Not yet. I'm still figuring it out. We'll remain married, but things will be different, and you must be strong and not take sides. She's your mother, and she loves you, and that's between her and me. You've been a blessing to us and a perfect daughter. I don't want your life to be disrupted because of our mistakes. But I urge you not to judge us and know that we love you more than anything. She was in tears now, acknowledging that she knew it hurt me. I didn't want her to feel guilty, but she was right. She needed to understand why life was changing in our home. Sarah was taken aback to see us return home together, and from the expression on Angel's face, she could tell that I had informed her. Angel shot her a disdainful glance and retreated to her room without uttering a word to her mother. You told her? She sensed that something was amiss, and she deserves to be informed. Changes are looming for us, and she ought to comprehend why. You can elucidate it to her once she recovers from the shock. What kind of changes are you talking about? You're not planning to divorce me, are you? Not at this moment. I want to observe how things unfold, and besides, I wouldn't subject Angel to that. However, there will undoubtedly be changes starting today. Johnny, you have to let me explain what occurred and attempt to understand. You're my husband, and I love you. Well, you willingly betrayed me with William over 500 times behind my back. That's the gist of it. Sarah, I'm not sure there's anything you could say that a man with self-respect could accept. Do you truly think I'm that feeble? Clearly, you haven't fully considered this. What truly saddens me is that I can no longer relish the intimacy we once shared and eagerly anticipated. I'll never share a bed with you again, and I'll miss the act of lovemaking, but not nearly as much as your affectionate gestures. This will inflict considerable pain on me. Other changes are inevitable since you've broken your marital vows and our contract. Like you, I'll no longer remain faithful and will seek other partners. Of course, I've never considered such a thing before, so it may take some time before I find someone suitable. You can continue seeing your lover as you'll receive nothing more from me. It was as though she had been struck on the head, visibly recoiling from my words. She stumbled and sank onto the couch, clearly taken aback. Sarah seemed oblivious to the gravity of her infidelity. Johnny, you can't be with other women. It would devastate me and I won't allow it. I love you. What happened isn't what it seems. I know it sounds awful, but let me explain. 
Sarah, 500 times behind my back, and now you realize the consequences of your actions? Yes, Sarah, you've changed everything. Don't forget, it's all because of your cheating, lying, and betrayal. Just then, the doorbell rang, providing a timely interruption. I let the workers in and showed them the bed to be removed. They got to work, dismantling it. What's going on? Who are these men? Well, Sarah, since we'll never share a bed again, I thought it wouldn't be fair for either of us to move to the guest room. So I bought two new beds. Our old one is being removed now, and the new ones will be set up. There's a 90-day trial for your mattress, so if you don't like it, you have three months to choose another. We're sleeping in separate beds. Yes, it's only fair. Since we won't be intimate, I don't want you in my bed. I can't believe you're doing all this. Yeah, and I can't believe you cheated on me with your boss 500 times, so I guess we're even, I said, watching the men take away the bed we had shared for so long, feeling a mix of pain and regret. Regret that I was married to a cheating spouse. The following day, I placed a crucial call. Tony, you won't believe what I've just discovered. My wife, Sarah, has been having an affair with her boss for the past three years, meeting him twice a week. I've come to realize she's betrayed me over 500 times without my knowledge. I feel utterly deceived and humiliated, unsure of what steps to take next. Who's the guy? Tony inquired. Her boss, William Aston. That's awful, man. What do you want to do about it? I want him to suffer, to endure the consequences of his actions in the worst possible manner. For years he's been with my wife, while I've remained oblivious. He's cuckolded and disgraced me and I can't bear it. And Sarah? She is no longer there for me. I'll file for divorce once Angel goes off to college and ensure she faces the consequences before I leave. Right now she'll lead a solitary existence as I cut her off completely. If she attempts to divorce me before Angel starts school, I'll ruin her career and expose her actions to everyone. You're in a tough spot, buddy. How about I handle Mr. Aston while you manage things at home and try to salvage what you can? Tony, I don't want you getting into trouble. Don't take any risks that could lead to your arrest. Do you understand? Absolutely, bro. You can count on me. We'll talk again soon. The weeks that followed were tense at home. Despite Sarah's attempts to initiate conversation, I only responded with brief, unenthusiastic replies. It was evident she felt frustrated, trying to mend things, but my hurt and anger persisted, rendering me unyielding. Immersed in work, I returned home late each night and was absent on weekends, creating a palpable tension where everyone tiptoed around, anticipating my outburst. One evening, arriving home weary from work, I found Sarah waiting in her bed, seeking a conversation. After years of sharing a bed with the woman I loved, now I lay just a few feet away, a poignant reminder of our strained relationship. Unsure how I'd endure this arrangement for the next two years until Angel departed for university, I showered and settled into my bed. Johnny, how was your day? Sarah's voice broke the silence. Fine, was my curt reply. Johnny, I've been reflecting, and I want to talk to you about some things to hear your thoughts. Despite your distance, I still love you and am willing to take small steps to improve our situation. I've been considering quitting my job, we don't really need the extra income, and I could dedicate more time to supporting you. What do you think, darling? No matter how hard I tried to control my anger, when I heard her address me as baby and attempt to exploit our intimacy, I couldn't help but explode with rage. I abruptly sat up and spoke sharply while she stared at me, clearly taken aback. Listen, Sarah, I couldn't care less about what you choose to do. Whether you work or not, whether you're with your boyfriend or find someone new, it's your life. Do as you please. But don't call me baby, honey, or anything besides Johnny. The more I dwell on it, the more I realize you should keep your job and your bi-weekly rendezvous with William because you'll never have me again. Tears welled up in my eyes as I turned away and buried my head in the pillow. I listened to Sarah's sobs grow louder as she came to grasp the depth of her betrayal and its painful impact. Johnny, I don't expect you to respond, but please allow me a moment to speak. I can't fully express how remorseful I am and how deeply sorry I feel for hurting you. 
I need you to understand that my love for you never wavered. The anguish I've caused surpasses anything I could have imagined. The absence of your touch, your kisses, your embrace. It's tearing me apart. Your distance has shattered my heart. Yes, I long for us to be intimate again. But more than anything, I crave your affection and love. I'm at a loss for what to do or how to mend this, but I'm terrified of losing you. Please know that I'm here whenever you're ready to talk or ask anything, and I'm prepared to divulge everything. Johnny, the tension in our home is toxic, and I fear it's affecting Angel as well. She's withdrawing, seeking solace in her friends, and expressing a desire to leave. I've been considering counseling as a way for us to coexist without this animosity. Would you be open to it? I don't expect an immediate response, but please give it some thought. If not for me, then for Angel. I acknowledge my responsibility in this, but it's unfair to her. She'll be gone in a few years, and we shouldn't subject her to a household filled with resentment. I let out a sigh, acknowledging she was correct. Angel was enduring this nightmare, and it wasn't just. After a brief pause, much to Sarah's astonishment, I responded. Fine, set up an appointment and I'll attend. However, let me clarify. I'm doing this for Angel, not for you. Sarah's smile reflected a sense of achievement. Her tears now transformed into tears of joy. Thank you, Johnny. I'll handle everything, she assured. The following evening, Sarah informed me that she had found a therapist and would be meeting them alone the next day. She mentioned scheduling a couple's session for Friday at 3 p.m. Understanding Sarah's perspective, I realized that if I didn't want a lengthy divorce process, finding a path to peaceful coexistence was imperative. Angel's optimism soared upon learning about the counseling sessions, hoping for a chance to reunite our family. Sarah relayed Angel's happiness to me, expressing how pleased she was about our decision to seek help. Johnny, Angel was overjoyed when she heard about the couple's counseling. Her smile said it all, Sarah recounted that night as I returned from work. I found myself dining alone every evening, avoiding spending time with Sarah. Yet amidst this, I couldn't shake the longing to be with my daughter. I missed her smile, her embraces, and her calling me daddy. After Sarah's individual counseling session, she seemed drained. Arriving home, I discovered her in tears, realizing the difficulty she must have faced in confronting the truth of her actions. Strangely, I felt no sympathy or empathy for the woman who had shattered my heart. Later that week, my brother Tony called me to fill me in on the situation. He informed me that he still had outstanding favors owed to him by his former associates, who had ties to the cartel. Despite the cartel's reputation for ruthlessness and violence, they were committed to honoring their debts. Tony's debt was not monetary, but rather in the form of favors owed for past assistance he had provided. He had admitted guilt, served his time, and shielded two influential figures within the cartel. You don't need to know the details, brother. The less you're involved, the better. Just know this. Vengeance is on the horizon. After reaching out to one of his contacts, Tony outlined the scenario. They grasped the situation and assured him they would handle it, notifying him upon completion. Tony clarified that they didn't intend to kill the target, but to leave a lasting impression for the rest of his life. He entrusted them with the details, the individual's name, workplace, and phone number. That was all they required to proceed. Two weeks after Johnny's initial session with the couple, it was now William Aston's residence that was targeted. A white van had been parked across the street from the Aston's house, and shortly after William arrived home and pulled into the garage, a young man knocked on their front door. Upon joy. Aston opening the door, the three men lurking nearby forcefully entered the house, brandishing automatic weapons and carrying a duffel bag. Hearing the disturbance, William went to investigate only to be seized, placed in a chair, and bound. Another chair was brought in and positioned opposite William, Joy Aston was coerced into sitting across from her husband, her hands secured to the chair, compelling the couple to face each other. William, you were disobedient, and today is the day of reckoning, Jose said in a deep Colombian accent. You messed with the wrong woman and ruined her marriage. Now you will pay for your sins, he continued in a deep Spanish accent. Juan took out an eight-inch knife and turned his attention to Joy. Are you ready to witness how your beautiful wife will pay for your sins? 
Tell me, William. William pleaded. No, not her. Please take me. Spare her. I see that you claim to care for your wife, but at the same time you commit infidelity. We're not buying it, William. No, please don't, Joy. I am deeply remorseful. This is all my doing, and I'm truly sorry. You are a despicable scoundrel. Your actions with that married woman led us to this. I hate you. Up on hearing this, the men burst out laughing. No one is going to die today. Yes, there will be suffering, but without fatalities, he assured, nodding towards Jesus. They loosened the straps on William's arms while the two men held him in the chair. Jose turned to William. You will live, but you will carry the burden of your deeds for the rest of your days. Addressing the men, he simply commanded, Keep going. After they put tourniquets on both hands, a cruel punishment was committed. We're leaving soon, and I advise you to call an ambulance before it's too late. If you tell us about our appearance or conversation, we will come back to harm you, your husband, and children. It's in your best interest to remain silent. Do you understand, Joy? Yes, she sobbed. This warning also applies to your unfaithful husband. If he gets one of us involved, it won't end well for him. He brought this on himself, and this is his consequence. After talking, they tightened the tourniquet on William's arms, packed their things, and left, leaving Joy untied with instructions to wait two minutes before calling. In the van, they took off their gloves and overalls, putting them in a large bag when Jose left. They drove 20 miles south on the highway before the police arrived and eventually reached their safe house 50 miles away. Fortunately, the ambulance arrived immediately after the call. Paramedics found Joy hysterical and William unconscious. It was an unusual scene for paramedics, and the police suspected that this was no ordinary burglary. Nothing was stolen, and the missing appendages suggested revenge. Joy, in shock, remained silent in front of the police, too scared to speak. William also remained silent, pretending that he did not know about the motives of the break-in. Despite the police investigation, they knew it was a dead end. William managed to survive, but he was now faced with the challenge of adapting to life without the use of his fingers. This irreversible change had dawned upon him, and he understood the reasons behind it. He had never anticipated that his actions could carry such severe repercussions, especially originating from a seemingly mild-mannered accountant like Sarah. Though lacking concrete evidence, he couldn't shake the suspicion that Sarah, apart from his wife, was the only woman he had been involved with. Upon learning that Johnny had discovered their affair and terminated it, William was devastated. His affection for Sarah and the emotional fulfillment she provided him with left him shattered. Evidently, Sarah and William had regarded themselves as a couple during their time together, sharing genuine love in those fleeting moments. Initially, they had never imagined that their occasional rendezvous could inflict harm on anyone. They simply viewed it as two friends enjoying each other's company. Both had convinced themselves that their spouses were oblivious to any sacrifices or missed affections, as their weekly meetings amounted to only a few hours seemingly inconsequential to their partners. It seemed like the perfect arrangement, reigniting excitement and affection that had dulled over years of marriage. Now, both Sarah and William were forced to confront the fallout of their actions. William would be haunted by the consequences of his infidelity every minute of his life. He faced the looming prospect of losing his job, requiring extensive mental and medical support, abandoning his favorite pastime of golfing, and mastering basic tasks without the use of his fingers. In an instant, his life had been irreversibly altered due to what had appeared to be the perfect affair. Indeed, choices do carry significant consequences. Following the meeting with Dr. Doris Winters, Ph.D., the counselor, their session commenced. It unfolded precisely as Johnny anticipated, and he listened attentively as Ms. Winters initiated the conversation. Johnny, Sarah, and I had a meeting this week. She briefed me on everything, and I explained our session procedures to her. I appreciate your willingness to come and attempt to reconcile. Please answer honestly, knowing that confidentiality is paramount. I've heard it all, and nothing will shock me. I'm saying this to ensure you feel comfortable sharing openly with a stranger. I nodded, curious about where this dialogue would lead. Sarah, could you please articulate your aspirations for these sessions to Johnny? 
My unfaithful wife glanced at me, tears welling in her eyes, and said, Johnny, there's so much I want to express to you. I long to reunite our family, to reconnect with you emotionally and physically. I yearn to rediscover our bond and restore everything to how it once was. I have to admit her emotions were deeply affecting, and I could sense the sincerity in her words. Witnessing her anguish over losing my affection was tough, but I maintained composure, silently observing as she dabbed her eyes with a handkerchief. Mr. Park, what are your goals for these sessions? Dr. Winters, I'm hoping to find a way to rid myself of this fixation on the number 500. If we can achieve that, I believe we can return to some semblance of normalcy. I noticed Sarah flinch and avert her gaze upon hearing me mention 500. Mr. Park, I'm confused. What significance does this number hold for you? And why is it crucial to remove it from your thoughts? So, Doris, may I address you as Doris? Let's stick with Dr. Winters for now, shall we? Well, Doris, I remarked sarcastically. I assumed you had a session with Sarah this week, so the number should have surfaced. Turning to Sarah, I asked, Sarah, did you miss this little detail? Please, Mr. Park, this is not constructive. Could you please clarify your statement regarding the number 500? Good. As you know from my experience as an accountant, numbers are very important to me. What my wife didn't disclose is that over the past three years, Sarah has allowed William to get intimate with her more than 500 times. This number is imprinted in my memory, and whenever it occurs, it is the first thought in my mind. She had an affair with this man 500 times behind my back, and every time she brought him to our bed, I declared, my voice full of anger and tears. The heavy silence dragged on for several minutes while the emotions subsided. Mr. Park, I sympathize with your pain, but such expressions are inappropriate here. It's insulting and inappropriate, the psychologist said. I apologize, and it won't happen again. However, it was necessary to formulate my suffering and point of view, I admitted. Sarah cried, repeating, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. Gradually, my anger subsided as my outburst waned. Once again, I apologize for my outburst. To answer your question, I am striving to find a way to forgive Sarah to the extent that we can create a home free from hostility and resentment. We have a daughter who should not suffer the consequences of her mother's infidelity. I strive to find a way for our peaceful coexistence, I concluded. Thank you, Mr. Park. Over the following weeks, I endeavored to communicate in a cordial manner, devoid of any bitterness. The atmosphere at home improved somewhat. Not perfect, but definitely better. Angel was around more frequently, and we made efforts to engage in typical couple activities like dining out, going to the movies, and socializing with friends. However, there was a conspicuous absence of intimacy between us. I refrained from holding her hand, we never exchanged kisses, and physical touch was non-existent. Our friends noticed this stark contrast to our usual affectionate behavior over the past 15 years, prompting some to inquire about what was amiss. Despite the evident struggles, we persevered. Upon learning of William's accident, Sarah was profoundly affected. Even though William remained silent about the incident, Sarah sensed Johnny's desire for retribution and suspected his involvement. She awaited a reaction. That evening, when she recounted the break-in and assault at her boss's house to Johnny, she observed his response closely. A fleeting smirk crossed his face before he casually remarked, Wow, that's something, and returned to reading his book. Is that all you have to say? She pressed. Her tone and remark hit a nerve, causing him to glare at her. Oh, I apologize for your lover's injury. Shall I send him flowers, or would you prefer we visit him, darling? She averted her gaze, and the conversation came to an end. Sarah understood that, somehow, I was to blame for this, and if I expressed regret for caring about William, all the progress they had made would be undone. Earlier that week, Johnny received a text from Tony with a thumbs-up emoji. That marked their last communication for several months as things cooled down. Johnny wondered if the authorities would uncover their affair and question him about the assault, but that never occurred. The police eventually filed the report as an open case and shifted their focus to other crimes. 
The culprits and the motive behind the attack remained unknown. As promised, Johnny began dating and staying out late, which became apparent to Sarah after she questioned him a few times about his activities. She soon realized it was best to mind her own business and avoid causing any further problems. Johnny made it clear that their marriage was in name only, and they were living together for the sake of their daughter. Over time, they managed to maintain a civil relationship, and their family life seemed to be going smoothly. Sarah eventually understood the extent of the pain she had caused her husband, but felt helpless to change the situation. Johnny kept the family together by threatening to expose her affair to her family and friends and make her life miserable if she pursued a divorce before their daughter Angel went off to college. Despite still being married, Sarah felt alone. She had no one to show her affection to, something she had always valued. Giving hugs, kisses, and love had been central to her identity. But now the two men she had shared that with were gone. She continued to work and live with a sense of sadness, aggravated by the knowledge that her husband was enjoying himself with another woman. Counseling offered some solace, though she attended sessions alone, as Johnny couldn't forgive her for her betrayal. She realized she had brought this upon herself through her vanity, selfishness, and foolishness, ultimately destroying her marriage and the man she loved. There was no sympathy in Angel's eyes for her. Despite Angel's enduring love for her mother, whenever Angel heard complaints about her father, she couldn't help but remind her that she brought this on herself. Angel constantly emphasized her father's love for her and the devastation he felt the night he caught her mother with another man. Although Angel could never forgive her mother for hurting her father so much, her love for her mother remained unconditional. William was left without a job and divorced. Living in a small apartment with a limited budget, he gave up almost 70% of his property, paying alimony for his three children, child support, and allowing his ex-wife Joy to live in the house for another 10 years until their youngest turns 18. Due to his struggle with depression, he could not use his hands properly. Ironically, he stopped being with the two women he loved and became lonely and unwanted. As promised by the attackers, his missing fingers served as a constant reminder of his affair with Sarah. A year after the divorce, William couldn't stand it and did something terrible to himself. After their affair, neither Sarah nor William spoke anymore each in their own way painfully experiencing the consequences of their infidelity and betrayal. After Angel departed for college, Johnny returned home one day bearing divorce papers. A year prior, Johnny had contemplated sabotaging their finances and ruining Sarah, but he ultimately opted for an equitable split. Despite forgiving her over the following two years, the love he once harbored had vanished irrevocably. Sarah wasn't surprised by the divorce papers and signed them without resistance, acknowledging her role in destroying their relationship and squandering his affection. Yet, there was a sense of relief within her, perhaps signaling the possibility of a fresh start. Having learned her lesson, she vowed never to betray again. Parting ways with the woman he had cherished for so long was agonizing, and Johnny was consumed by regret for the series of events that led to their separation. He longed to retract it all or somehow find it in himself to pardon her, but despite his efforts, he couldn't shake off the memory of that damning 500. They sold their home and divided the proceeds, with Johnny moving in with Trisha, a dancer 15 years his junior, whom he had been seeing. With his confidence and joy reinstated, he finally found solace. Meanwhile, Sarah clung to hope for reconciliation and wept for weeks upon learning of his remarriage. Sarah couldn't forgive herself when she contemplated the havoc her selfishness and arrogance had wrought on lives. While she dated a few men, she never rediscovered the love she had forfeited. She gained weight, her beauty faded, and she morphed into a bitter, solitary, older woman. Angel and Sarah had a strong bond, but Sarah never received any communication from Johnny afterward she would never again encounter the same level of love she shared with her amazing husband, and instead carried the burden of causing pain to many loved ones. Johnny ensured that Angel's college education was financed and looked after. Angel pursued a career as a psychologist driven by a desire to aid others. 
she married a doctor and enjoyed a fulfilling life. Angel diverged from her mother's trajectory and stayed loyal to her husband. Together, they raised five children and maintained a close relationship with both her father and mother.